evening, everyone. Welcome to Talking Law. Our guest has arrived. Mary, thank you so much. I know you haven't um, come on po Talking Law podcast yet. I think you're next. Is it next week? Yeah. Um, but thank you for joining us this evening. You are a barrister, very experienced. I've stopped using senior because this makes everyone sound old, including me. Um, um, in crime, you are a recorder, um, and which is a, a part-time judge. You are a QC, as I said, and uh, your journey into the bar or at the bar has been an interesting one. Can you tell us from the beginning, please, you know, why you came to the bar, what sort of upbringing you had? Okay. Um, I grew up in Stoke-on-Trent, which is in the Midlands. I'm the youngest of five. Uh, my dad was a coal miner. Um, I'm quite proud of this, but it's rather boring actually that I can trace my coal mining family's background right back to about 1730. So um, I, I rather hope for something exotic in my background, but I can tell you that on both sides, right through, um, it's coal miner marrying coal miner's daughter producing more coal miners and coal miner's daughters and it, it carried on and on. Um, we emigrated to Stoke-on-Trent when I was five because the pit that my dad worked in in the northeast closed and the entire Geordie community moved together to Stoke-on-Trent and we all lived in a national coal board housing estate um, together. So rather like you see those groups of English people who emigrate to Spain and they just stay in their English community. That's exactly what we were like. So um, my brother, who was about 11 when we moved, still has a thick Geordie accent, even though he's lived in the Midlands his entire life. Um, after about a year uh, living there, my dad broke his back in a coal mining accident, which um, caused our next door neighbour um, to die and so he couldn't walk in the coal mine anymore um, and my mum then was basically the main breadwinner uh, and she worked in a variety of factories um, sewing packing tiles that kind of thing um, and we went on to um, quite severe financial difficulties my dad got a variety of jobs firstly with Remploy which was a charity that helped people with um, disabilities get back into work and then he worked as a crane driver and he um, because he'd been a miner from the age of 14 he had really bad lungs so he had um, emphysema or bronchitis and so in order to work he would climb up the coal uh, climb up the crane in the morning and he would stay there all day and then climb down in the evening. He didn't come down at all during the day because he couldn't do the journey twice. Um, and that's where I grew up. So I was the youngest, as I say, of, of five. Um, my eldest two brothers joined the forces and my elder two sisters went into nursing. Um, nobody had A-levels in our family and no one had ever been to university. It wasn't a thing that people did. Um, my biggest ambition at 16 was not to get pregnant. I just thought if I could avoid getting pregnant, I might actually have a chance in life. And I did manage to avoid getting pregnant, um, mainly because I was a bit of a nerd, actually. So um, I liked reading and I liked um, all the sorts of things that a lot of people who lived around me really weren't interested in at all. And I felt a bit like a Martian. Yeah. And um, I did okay in my GCSEs. Um, and then I was doing my A-levels um, and I got bullied quite a bit because um, I didn't really have any social skills having grown up where I did compared to the other bright students. And I moved to live with my sister in Essex. Uh, and so uh, that was in the middle of my A-levels and I had to choose three A-levels that I could complete in the year. And one of them I chose was law. And that was for no other reason than that I could do that A-level in a year. Um, I wasn't bad at it. Um, and I had to choose something to go and do at university. Quite why I decided I was going to give to university, I don't really know, but I did. And um, I was fortunate because at the time I went, um, it was free. 
um, or at least the tuition fees were free. I had two jobs right through to pay for my living expenses. Um, and when I finished my degree, um, I had to do four years because my dad sadly died um, at the end of my second year. So I had to retake that year because I couldn't do the exams. Uh, when I finished, I, there was a big book then. I don't, I don't know if it still exists now. It's about this big. And it was graduate jobs. So I just applied to every place in that book. And I got a job working for Volvo. <laughs> it's hilarious because um, I knew nothing about cars. I don't know why they took me on. I was the first female graduate they had, and I suspect I might have been the last. So I'm sorry if I blocked. I was absolutely hopeless, hopeless at this job. And um, they gave me a company car, which was an exciting Volvo, um, which I managed when reversing out of the car park on the first day to hit the car next to me. So there was probably an omen there that this was, <laughs> this was not going to be a great, a great experience. Um, anyway, I managed that for a year and I, I just, it just wasn't me. It was, uh, anyway, uh, after that, I saw a job advertised for a magistrate's court clerk. I, I got that job, I loved it, worked there for about six years. And it was them that sent me off to qualify. And the reason I ended up doing the bar course was because the solicitor's course was full. That was, that was it. It was, it was full. Uh, and so I went on the bar course and I think actually it really suited me because it's quite a vocational course. So you learn practical skills, which um, I wasn't bad at. And I think that was the first time in my life where I felt very much that I could actually do the job. Of course, I couldn't date pupillage because I couldn't possibly have afforded it. There was no um, pupillage awards at that time. But I was really lucky and I got a sponsored pupillage with CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, worked there for six years, um, really enjoyed it. But at the time they paid really badly uh, and they offered early redundancy. So I thought, because I'm a bit strange, I thought I'll give, I'll give it a go. I'll give being a barrister a, a go, going to the independent bar. So at that time I had a two-year-old, a one-year-old and a baby. I cried when I found out I was pregnant with the baby, by the way. But anyway, so I had a two-year-old, a one-year-old <laughs> and a baby. And uh, I went to the bar and I applied to every chambers that there was everywhere. And I got so many rejections. And to start with, I was making them into a paper bird. And in the end, they made a papier-mâché turkey and, and quite a fat one at that. But I, I just kept applying and I got one interview in a very small set of chambers called Clock Chambers in Wolverhampton, who gave me a chance. And I, um, you know, I have been forever grateful ever since. Um, and so they let me join chambers. And about two days before I joined, three quarters of the members of chambers left and set up another chambers. So when I, <laughs> when I got there, it was a bit small uh, and it was all a bit worrying. Um, but I just thought, well, I'm here now. And I gave it my best shot. I started doing trials in the magistrates court and the solicitors were kind enough to give me briefs in the crown court. And the rest of it really is history. I just kept working, kept plugging away and eventually was um, taken to one side and asked if I'd like to join 36 Bedford Road to which I went, yeah. I got wood actually that sounds that sounds quite nice Very so well. I joined 36 Bedford Road and um after a bit my clerk who is a woman um we we are so fortunate to have a female practice manager said um about time you took silk so I laughed really loudly because people like me don't take silk um and I said no that year and I said no the next year and um, she took me out for a large glass of wine, by which I mean a bottle. And at the end of that, she said, um, you will apply next year, won't you? Promise me. And I said, yes. And I, I never break a promise. So um, I did. And I got it. Um, and the following year, I applied to sit as a recorder and I got that. So that's basically how I got where I got to. And once I got the position of QC, I was absolutely determined to use that very um, privileged position to 
highlight and try to help anyone who wants a career at the bar who comes from what you might describe as a non-traditional background which in this profession means your mum isn't a barrister your dad isn't a barrister and you know you can't trace your family back generations as barristers so i um run women in criminal law in the midlands together with michelle healy i'm now the social mobility ambassador for the midland circuit having nagged sufficiently long enough to get the midland circuit to agree to have a social mobility ambassador which means i'm trying to persuade um, people aged between 13 and 16 to consider a career in law and i run a schools competition to help state school students to consider a career in law and I also am a social mobility ambassador for the Bar Council and I have the best life. I, I love my job. It, it's such a tremendous privilege to do and it's particularly thrilling to be a woman in this job because as you can see I've got a great face for radio. So um, it's never been something that's held me back in any way. Uh, people don't judge me on my looks. They don't judge me on my dress sense because we all wear a uniform all the time. I'm judged on my ability and on my um, capacity to, to be a good advocate. And I think the key, absolute key to good advocacy is to understand people. And the best way to understand people is to have been a person. So I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to be looked down on. I know what it's like to be judged um, for being less than because I don't go skiing in Gestad and, you know, I, I don't have, um, I, I just don't have all of the background that people think that barristers should have. Um, and when we were poor and I had free school meals, I, you know, I did feel it. Although as a plus, because we had a uniform grant, I got a uniform grant, I had the best school uniform in the school because the only grant went to the really good haberdashery kind of shop. So um, that was a, that was a plus. I did have a fabulous school uniform. Um, but, but life for me has been astonishingly good. I, work hard um probably too hard and i um I, i've been really really fortunate to have met some amazing women like sally who has a family and who on top of having a really busy practice um runs this organization to do precisely this job we i think um can easily as a profession walk beside each other and help each other and succeed the the sad fact is that some people think that the only way to succeed in life is to walk on top of someone or to make someone else feel small it isn't I, i've never subscribed to that version of events i've been glad whenever i can to walk beside somebody and I hope when you start your careers, you also walk beside someone because each time that you do a small act of kindness, it, you will be amazed at the ripple effect that it creates. So I've been doing some Q and A's for students on Zoom. And one young girl said to me, I say young girl, she's probably mid twenties, but I'm very old. So um, she said to me, there's nothing out there for me to practice my advocacy. Um, what, what can I find? And I said, well, what are you doing about it? What have you done to, to, to sort it out? And um, she looked completely taken aback because it hadn't occurred to her that the solution to problems can be you. Um, and she got off the webcam chat. She started um, looking for other people to do it. And she's now really busy running, um, you know, advocacy training sessions. You, you just need to understand that there is no one better than you. Um, you have all the skills that you require to be amazing. Um, you just need to use them. And the only real difference between those who succeed and those who don't is a level of stubbornness. I'm stubborn. So if I want something, I just keep going for it. And I don't care when people tell me no. Um, 
I think all good lawyers see an obstacle as an opportunity. So that's my story. Wow, Mary, can we do a virtual round of applause? Okay, very interesting. interesting. Inspiring. I'll, I'll oh. do the full screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, that was Sarah. We couldn't all see it. Nez, are you there? Is the dog still with you? She's writing inspirational in the chat box. Oh, <laughs> we're still there. <laughs> oh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, I'm a daughter of a lorry driver, or well, late lorry driver. So. Oh. so. Well, listen. No one better. No. Absolutely. Um, my motivational, mo my motivation, says Heiner. I don't understand that. I think maybe because you're Canadian, the English is a bit wobbled. Do you mean great motivation? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, if I just ask you all to mute yourselves, except for Mary and me, and I'll ask the first question, and I'm sure you've all got questions. Um, before I start my questions, Catherine, my PA, has asked me to say, you know, you can buy this book, all the money is good to charity. Mary is on page 167, and she really is inspiring, you know, if you want to just read a bit more about her. Uh, it's on Amazon. So Mary, um, my first two questions, the first one is just really, that was really inspiring. I mean, I've been saying you are an inspirational role model before you came on, and I'm sure everyone will agree that you are. Now they've heard you, it's not just uh, me elevating in any, any shape or form. Um, I'm quite factual. So you are, and you're brilliant. So my first question is really, where do you find the strength to really be passionate about the causes? You know, you're a, a, a grown up version of me or what I want to be or, or whatever. And there are many people who are of your experience of seniority, Mary, who do bugger all. There are. Um, and, you know, I see you on LinkedIn giving advice to students um, on Zoom. Um, I remember one of your articles was about um, something which is a bugbear of mine. I'll come back to it. You know, students, if you're trying to get work experience via LinkedIn and you gave a 10 point advice about things that are good to do and things that are not good to do, you know, i.e. pictures of you in a bikini or in, in your wedding dress. No, people know I remove people's food, never mind, you know, bikinis or it's not professional. And so that takes energy. And I just wondered how you keep that going and where that energy comes from, because it's exhausting, particularly dealing with the younger end with students. They're quite needy um actually no offense i don't know all of you but generally you really have to i mentor loads of them you yeah. know they need a lot of hand holding and, and there's different there is the resilience isn't there so where do you find the passion from and the energy really to do so much because you can make such a difference to people if i want because i'm very proud to be a barrister and genuinely very proud to, to have reached this um, level of life. I desperately want this profession to reflect the people who live in our society. I want it to be a profession that reflects the people who we serve because that's what we do. We are their, we're their advocates. We are the people who speak for them when they can't speak for themselves. And I know that if you see someone who has achieved what you're looking to do with perhaps the same or, or even more of a um, background issue, if you'd like it, put it that way, then it's, it's easily possible to inspire someone to go on to the next level. So th the things that give me energy are receiving an email from a student saying, you won't remember me, but two years ago, you spent 20 minutes talking to me about this. I've just done my first case. You were, you were right. I, I, um, I was just worrying about nothing. Or you, you have people who ask you to do a mock interview with them and they send you an email back saying, I got in, um, I've progressed. The, there was a, a young man who I had seen in the, in the school's competition that I run, and I've been running it for about 15 years now. And he sent me an email when he started in Chambers. 
and I hadn't heard from him for 14 years and he, he was in chambers. He was um, just doing his GCSEs at, at the time. Uh, and anything like that, to me, it, it, it's just like rubies and diamonds. I think this world is such an amazing place and I'm in a really privileged position that if I can help somebody, it makes me feel good and happy. Mm. It, it genuinely does. When I, get, um, when I get annoyed is when people don't take the opportunities that life offers because life is short. It's so short. Mm. And so when you're offering people a Zoom session, for example, and you'll say, um, all you've got to do if you want to join is, is send me a direct message, which, which has got your email address on it. So people will send me a message which says, hey, I want to join the meeting, exclamation mark. And, you know, I, I'm a busy practitioner. So I then have to send them an email back saying, well, would you like to send me your email address? And then they'll send me another one back several days later. Or, for example, I ran a Zoom session last night and several people joined 40 minutes into the session. So that's taken because I don't allow huge amounts of people in the sessions because you can't communicate. Yeah. That takes the place of someone else. That, that I find difficult and frustrating but i think to some extent it's because um people perhaps haven't worked haven't done a job haven't understood the need for commitment and the need to um to, to be on time and to to be ready to to ask the questions but you know if, if you get an opportunity in life um take it uh, and prepare for it and enjoy it don't sit there thinking oh, well, you know, someone will sort all this out for me because life just isn't like that. And th that's the thing I find frustrating. But yeah. um, I do enjoy it. And it, it's a bit of light relief from, you know, another murder, another death, which um, is my workload. And that's um, heavy work. And I, it's, as I say, it's a privilege to do it. But this is just something that I can do to give back. And I think anyone who has the privilege of this role should be giving something back. Hear, 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 Mary. Um, that was so well put. So my next got a question, and then we'll go to the floor. Is um, your adventure at Gray's Inn? Um, adventure. Oh right. Well, I don't. I don't really know how. I just assumed you were. This has got me into trouble before. So yeah. ventures are like an elevated. Uh, They're like governors of the inn. Um, they are people who do a great deal for the inn and um, it, it's a mark of their status with, within the inn. I do um, education and training for the inn, yeah. but I'm not, I'm not a bencher. Right. Well, um, I, I have to say I did this. I'm a grayer, but I don't train for them. I train for Middle Temple. It's a bit naughty. Um, but it, it was really a question about what, what role do you think our institutions can play? You know, when I go to court, it's still often me. I'm sure when you sit often in the, in the judges' dining rooms, it's probably only you talking about, I don't know, Bake Off. I'm sure they're still talking about golf uh, or ski trips or, or, you know, all the, um, the other things that you don't really want to talk about. You know, we could talk about Trump, for God's sake, but still, they bang on about things. So I just wondered, you know, what role do you think maybe institutions could play or all of us as individuals, so it's not always down to the people who are sharing their experiences um, as such. Because I did notice in, I can't remember which one of your LinkedIn posts it was, but it got something like 32,000 views. And you were, yeah, I was like, and I thought, well, you know, do you, ha do you see that and go, yes, brilliant, brilliant. Because I often moan about that sort of platform where I write articles about the law, seven people read it, you know, and is the owner of a, a gin and tonic bar that, you know, or something. But you post something ridiculous. I said this before about wear, you know, wearing glitter for a month and raise two grand. How absurd. 40,000 people view it and like it. So, you know, I've, I'll finish where I started, which was, do you think our institutions or some of the organisations could do a bit more in terms of social mobility and encouraging so we're mo much more representative? I think they are beginning, in fairness, to understand the importance of it. 
Mm. It's the bar council, for example, is really trying hard to show people who have had non-traditional backgrounds. So the hashtag I am the bar. Oh yeah. Um, it is a pretty good way of seeing a number of people who have had non-traditional backgrounds. The, the difficulty is that lots of people who might consider being a barrister will never have looked on the general council of the bar website or know what an in of court is or, or anything of that nature. So I think what they all need to do probably is to come together and start creating small YouTube videos, small um, Insta sessions, just explaining to people in simple terms where they can find information out. People yeah. just don't understand that they actually, all, I think almost all the institutions offer great um, advice if, if you know where you're looking, if you know to look there. Yeah. And one of the difficulties with social mobility, particularly, is that if you've gone to a non-traditional university, for example, um, and if you've gone to one where um, not very many people go on to be a barrister, it may be that their careers department or their tutors aren't well versed in where they can look and what they can do. So students don't know, for example, that you can get... Um, either a reduction or, or all of your fees for the bar course paid um, if you are academically good. Um, they don't know about scholarships that you can get from the inns to pay for your courses um, if you've got financial difficulties. They don't know about schemes that we offer for people to have their travel expenses paid so they can go on mini pupillages. And when you tell people this, of course, they're thrilled and, and excited, but we need to get that information out i think everyone's doing it we're just not good at sharing it necessarily yes um mary it's going to be over to the floor i've unmuted everyone if you've got questions please raise your hand and i'll and, and ask it or write it in the box and i'll ask it whilst people are about to do that um we're in this horrible covid19 it's a disaster for health you know, my parents work in the NHS, so it's a constant stress. I just wondered, we've been asking on all our Zooms, one thing that people are grateful for, because it can be difficult to find positivity, especially when the weather has shown and reminded us that we are in England. This is what the country has been like the whole time. We've just been teased by the last few weeks of sunshine. So what's your one thing you're grateful for? Because I know you've got four, is it four or five children? I know, I know, I know. So listen, honestly. Um, so what's the one thing you're grateful for? Because I spoke to one of your sons before, during COVID-19 especially. I've been really um, happy to have had more time to spend with my children. So I've got four at home, plus a girlfriend, plus my husband, plus the dog. And um, because I'm not having to travel to work, I've got four extra hours in the day. Mm -hmm. And I've been just enjoying spending time with my boys. My youngest is 17, my oldest is 27. So there's a, a good age range there. Um, and remembering what matters. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes while you're busy in this job, you can actually forget to just look up and realize how amazing the people around you are um if i was at home now um as a teenager or or as a young person in their 20s um instead of feeling um depressed i would be really enjoying this time with my parents because in a little while when you're a barrister you will not have any time to do this you'll be running around here there and everywhere and you know your your parents will they'll go they, they, they will eventually be gone and this is an opportunity for you to ask them about their lives and their experiences so you can pass that information on to your children in time to gone by. My dad died when I was 21, my mum died when I was 29 and I never really got the time to sort of talk to them about their childhoods, their lives. It, it, it really is important while you've still got them, if you've still got them, to just spend the time talking to them about their own lives and experiences because 
they will have stories to tell you that you will not have considered that they're people yeah um, their company while you can that's what i think you should be doing brilliant so yeah. that is fantastic advice mary brilliant well let's do another virtual clap that was so awesome <laughs> Um, it was really, really good. I told you it was worth the wait. And, you know, and actually whilst we were waiting, we got to find out about a bit about each other. Mary, thank you for giving up, um, uh, you know, an hour of your time. We've overran horribly. It doesn't matter. It was so worth it and so brilliant. Um, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us and spending your evening with us. As I said, please buy Talking Law. It's on Amazon. I think it might be free delivery. Um, and the charities are Access to Justice, the Fawcett Equal Pay Society. Uh, I can't remember all the others. They're all listed on there. It's not going in my pocket. Um, so we'd love you to buy it and review it. We need 46 um, uh, reviewers, I think, to become an Amazon bestseller. And obviously say that Mary's story, which I said before, appears on page 167, is really inspiring. Look, there's loads of really cool people in there that uh, are interviewed, but um, it's a really good book, if I may say so myself. And uh, I think Mary, um, who gets longer, longer than others in there, is one of the really interesting um, people. And now you've met her in real life. So in the real world, when we get out of COVID, buy the book, bring it, and I'm sure Mary will sign it. Um, if we do the Birmingham event again. So thank you all so much. It was really nice to see you all. It's lovely to talk to you all. And um, I look forward to seeing you all on your feet at some stage. Good luck in your... Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.